Hello everyone. Let's talk about the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve today, okay? It's yucky. Let's just, nobody likes it. It's hard, it's complicated. There's this curve with lots of numbers, right, shift, left, shift. It's just confusing. So anytime something's confusing for me, I try to strip it down to its very, very basics to make sense, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do for you today. I'm gonna strip it down to its very basics so you can use it as a respiratory therapist, okay? And so the first thing I wanna do is make it relevant to you. I want you to understand why you use it or, or why you have to know about it, okay? And to do that, we have to really kind of have a concept of this blood flow through the heart. If you followed me very long, you know I love this picture. It really is the, the heart taken apart and the right, the right side is, is on this side. The left side of the heart is here. And it talks about how blood returns from, the oxygenated blood returns from the, the body to the right atrium. The right atrium ends up pumping that deoxygenated blood into eventually the pulmonary capillary bed. In the pulmonary capillary bed, CO2 is dropped off at the lungs to be exhaled. Oxygen is picked up, binds to hemoglobin. And then all that good oxygenated blood comes back to the left side of the heart where the left ventricle pumps it out into systemic circulations for the tissues of the body to have good oxygen. Okay, so when we're talking about the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve, what we're really talking about is how oxygen is carried in the blood. Okay, so oxygen is carried in the blood through something called an um, oxygen content, right? You've been in school, you've been given this formula, <clears throat> you've worked it a thousand times, but I want you to think about what it means, not about getting the math right, but understanding how this is utilized, okay? So at the level of the AC membrane, when oxygen crosses that AC membrane and gets into the bloodstream, it's transported, that oxygen is then transported the to the tissues in two manners, bound to hemoglobin, and dissolved in plasma. So part of this equation that you've learned is um, 1.34 times hemoglobin times the saturation. So I'm just gonna put sats right here, all right? The vast majority of tissue of oxygen that's carried to our tissues is bound to hemoglobin, okay? This is the side of the equation that really matters. All right, the other side of the equation is what is dissolved in plasma, which is the PaO2 times 0 0.003. Now, here's the deal. If all a person had to live on was the oxygen dissolved in plasma, they'd die. <laughs> this is not even enough oxygen to sustain life. What really matters is this side of the equation. This is where the majority of oxygen is transported to the tissues, okay? So I just have told you that, but yet we draw blood gases all the time and all we look at is the PaO2. I just told you it didn't matter and it doesn't. What matters is what's bound to hemoglobin. So the question is, how can we use the PaO2 when it doesn't matter do you see it has to correlate with oxygen saturations? And so there, there is correlation between the PaO2 and the saturations. And that correlation between the two is the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve, okay? So I'm just gonna give you the simplified version right now, okay? It's not hard. All this is is the relationship between what is dissolved in plasma, that's here on the uh, x-axis and what is bound hemoglobin, okay? And there's a relationship between the two. So here's what that relationship is. On the steep portion of that curve, all right, let's just start with a PaO2 of 20, right about there. If we follow this 20 up until it crosses that oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve, we're going to make a mark about right here, all right? So a PaO2 of 20 gives us a sat of about 30. Okay. If we increase, if, if somebody has a little bit higher PaO2, like a PaO2 of 30, do you see that the sats are, I don't know, around about in the middle between 40 and 50. 
So what we're seeing here is very small changes in the PaO2 results in really large changes in the saturation. And this is where the majority of oxygen is carried. So that's a really good thing because just a little bit of oxygen dissolved in the plasma will end up causing a lot of oxygen to be bound to the hemoglobin. So this relation continues with these big changes, you know, small changes in PaO2 results in big changes in SATs until we get to about 60. And see how that curve kind of flattens, okay? There's not a lot of change in the saturation at a PaO2 of 60 or higher, okay? You just don't get big increases. So again, there is a correlation between the PaO2 and what's dissolved in plasma and what's bound to hemoglobin, okay? Now, let's look at a little bit more of a complicated version. Don't make it hard, okay? So all we've done, this is the same curve. We've just put lines on it so we can plot some things a little bit easier, all right? And so right now what they're showing you is that that point where it flattens off, here's the PaO2 of 60. That gives us a SAT normally of about 90. Okay, you know when you go in and check somebody's saturation, put the pulse ox on, and their SAT is 91, and in your hospital, you may have a policy says as long as the SATs are greater than 90, everything's okay. That's because as long as the SATs are 90, we know the PaO2 is greater than 60, okay? And so that's where that comes from. This is a relationship. All right, there's this other place on the oxygen to hemoglobin disassociation curve where the saturations are 50%. And I know SATs of 50 stink, but all this is, is when we're saying where the SATs, when the SATs are 50%, like right here, okay, that PaO2 is about 27. All right, this dot here is called the P50. All right, so the P50 in a normal person is 27 millimeters of mercury. Now, why does this make a difference? It really doesn't. All it is is a point of reference, okay? It's just we plotted 50% on this curve, we put a dot there, and this is how we're gonna know if the curve shifts right or left. That's all it's for, okay? So if they were to ask a test question about the P50, they may ask what is normal P little a o2 when the hemoglobin's 50% saturated. Okay, so the normal P50 is 27. But again, we just use that to decide if this curve shifts right or left. Here's what I mean. Let me erase this. All right. So here's our P50. All right. There are some times that, or certain circumstances that happen in the body that the tissues will need more oxygen, okay? So those things might be, I don't know, an increased temperature, say, okay? If somebody is hyperthermic, we can agree that the tissues are gonna need more oxygen, all right? If somebody has an elevated PaCO2, tissues are gonna need more oxygen. Okay. If somebody is acidotic, okay, if they have an acidosis, whether that acidosis is caused by an increased CAO, a PaCO2 or if it's a metabolic acidotic, acidosis, if they are acidosis, the tissues need more oxygen. And there's this other thing called 2,3-DPG. Okay. The body has more 2,3-DPG that shifts this curve also. Okay, so here's where this goes. All of these things, do you see how I've drawn it on the right side of this chart? That's because it causes a shift to the right. What that means is this P50 ends up scooting to the right. So let's just put it right here. And what that means now is this whole curve See how that has shifted to the right? Okay, so a shift to the right. Here's why it matters. 
when certain things happen in the body, these things right here, the tissues need more oxygen and the hemoglobin gives that oxygen more readily to the tissues. It's called a decreased affinity. Anything that shifts this curve to the right, the hemoglobin let go of oxygen much more readily because the tissues need it, okay? So they just let it go. So when somebody has an elevated temperature, the curve shifts to the right so that the hemoglobin can say, here, have all the oxygen you need. And if, if a person has an increased CO2 or has an acidosis, the hemoglobin will decrease the affinity. It will give more oxygen to the tissues because the tissues need it. If we have increased levels of 2,3 DPG, which is a normal thing that happens in the red blood cell, the more we have, the easier the hemoglobin let loose of that oxygen, okay? Now, what's a right, right shift? Anything that scoots that P50 to the right, that's all that means. And that means in these conditions, the tissues need more oxygen, the hemoglobin gives it easier, all right? All right, let's talk about a left shift. This is pretty easy too. Any, any of these conditions, the opposite of these conditions will cause a left shift. So if somebody has a decreased temperature, if they are hypothermic. When a person's hypothermic, their tissues don't need as much oxygen, all right? Um, an alkalosis. A decrease PaCO2. And a decrease in 2,3-DPG. Okay, so what this means now if we take this P50, it's just a reference point, right? And we just scoot it over to the left, maybe right here. Do you see how this whole curve has kind of shifted to the left? All right, left shift curves, decreased temperature will cause a left shift. An alkalosis will cause a left shift. A decreased CO2 will cause a left shift. And if there's less 2,3 DPG, it'll cause a left shift. What this means is that the hemoglobin has an increased affinity. It means the hemoglobin is going to hold on really tight to that oxygen. It doesn't give it up as easy. Now the problem here is with the left shift, if it's holding on to that oxygen, if that hemoglobin holding on to that oxygen really, really tight, our tissues may get, get hypoxic because the hemoglobin's not letting loose to the tissue. Okay, so it decreased temperatures, alkalosis, decreased PaCO2s. All right, why we need to know this as a respiratory therapist? This is why. It's going to give you one example. All right, do you know how we say that one of the things that we need to do for a head trauma patient that has elevated ICPs is we need to hyperventilate them? Okay, hyperventilation causes an alkalosis. That's just that curve to the left. We, the hemoglobin holds on to oxygen, doesn't want to give it. Well, we don't want the brain to get hypoxic, right? So we have to make sure we've got plenty of oxygen dissolved in the plasma because we know the hemoglobin is going to hold on to it more, uh, more readily. If we put a patient on the vent and we accidentally hyperventilate them, which we don't want to do that, right? We accidentally hyperventilate them because we set the settings wrong. That means the hemoglobin's going to hold on to that oxygen and our tissues may get hypoxic. So this is relevant in clinical practice. Now, when it comes down to your board exams, they may ask you about the P50. Remember, P50 in a normal patient, it's when the hemoglobin is 50% saturated. I took that away a while ago. Hemoglobin is 50% saturated. PA, PaO2 is about 27. That P50 just allows for us to know if the curve shifts right or left. Anything that shifts it to the right, we have a D increased affinity, meaning that the, the hemoglobin is going to give oxygen to the tissues easier. Anything that shifts to the left, okay, that P50 shifting to the left, means hemoglobin has an increased affinity. Hemoglobin is going to hold on to that oxygen more readily, okay? So, kind of complicated, and that just got really busy. 
but go back and listen to it again and pause at various portions and see if it doesn't help. All right, if you have any questions, just email me. See you soon.